<laughs> Chipper it means cheerful, nonstop, happy. Uh, Wednesday, May 14th, advance. We're going to get into more of the intro from the Princess Bride. Blah, 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 stuff up there, blah, blah, blah. Pretend I didn't discover all this, and you guys are like, ooh, ah, journey. Ooh, ah, Turkey Challenge. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah. No, that's like I'm cheering. All right, uh, back to page 26. Now, we're going to have, actually, if you guys are dead, that you probably aren't even paying attention to this. We'll see what happens. Of course I understood. I felt just so deserted, though. I didn't like it, Dad. I wanted to. I smiled at him. How could he not like it? Passion, duels, miracles, giants, true love. You're not eating the spinach either? Helen said. I got up. Time change. I'm not hungry. She didn't say anything until she heard me open the front door. Where are you going? She called in. If I'd known, I would have answered. I wandered through December. No top coat. I wasn't aware of being cold, though. All I knew was I was 40 years old and didn't mean to be here when I was 40. Locked with this genius shrink wife and this balloon son. It must have been 9 o'clock when I was sitting in the middle of Central Park, alone. No one near me. No other bench occupied. That was when I heard the rustling in the bushes. It stopped. Then again, very soft, nearer. I whirled, screaming, Don't you bite me! And whatever it was, friend, foe, imagination, fled. I could hear the running, and I realized something. Right then, at that moment, I was dangerous. Then it got cold. I went home. Helen was going over some notes in bed. Ordinarily, she would have come out with something about me being a bit elderly for acts of juvenile behavior. But there must have been danger clinging to me still. I could see it in her smart eyes. He did try, she said finally. I never thought he didn't. Where's the book? The library, I think. I turned, started out. Can I get you anything? I said no. Went to the library, closed myself in, hunted out the Princess Bride. It was in pretty good shape. I realized as I checked the binding, which is when I saw it was published by my publishing house, Harcourt Grace Jovanovich. This was before that. They weren't even Harcourt Grace's world yet. Just plain old Harcourt Grace, period. I flicked the title page, which was funny, since I'd never done that before. It was always my father who'd done the handling. I had to laugh when I saw the real title, because right there it said, The Princess Bride, S. Morgenstern's classic tale of true love and high adventure. He had to admire a guy who called his own brand new book a classic before it was published, and anyone else had a chance to read it. Maybe he figured if he didn't do it, nobody would. Or maybe he was just trying to give the reviewers a helping hand. I don't know. I skimmed the first chapter, and it was pretty much exactly as I remembered. Then I turned to the second chapter, the one about Prince Humperdinck, and the little kind of tantalizing description of the zoo of death. And that's when I began to realize the problem. Not that the description wasn't there. It was, and again, pretty much as I remembered it. But before you got to it, there were maybe 60 pages of text dealing with Prince Humperdinck's ancestry and how his family got control of Flora and in this wedding and that child begatting this one over here who then married somebody else and then I skipped to the third chapter, the courtship. And that was all about the history of Gilder and how that country reached its place in the world. The more I flipped on, the more I knew. Morgan Stern wasn't writing a children's book. He was writing a kind of satiric history of his country and the decline of the monarchy in Western civilization. But my father only read me the action stuff, the good parts. He never bothered with the serious side at all. About two in the morning, I called Hiram in Martha's Vineyard. Hiram Hayden has been my editor for a dozen years, ever since Soldier in the Rain, and we've been through a lot together, but never any phone calls at two in the morning. To this day, I know he doesn't understand why I couldn't wait till maybe breakfast. You sure you're all right, Bill? He kept saying. Hey, Hiram, I began after about six rings. Listen, you guys published a book just after World War I. Do you think it might be a good idea for me to abridge it and we'd republish it now? You sure you're all right, Bill? Fine, absolutely. And see, I'd just use the good parts. I'd kind of bridge where there were skips in the narrative and leave the good parts alone. What do you think? Bill, it's two in the morning up here. Are you still in California? I acted like I was all shocked and surprised so he wouldn't think I was a nut. I'm sorry here. My God, what an idiot. It's only 11 o'clock in Beverly Hills. Do you think you could ask Mr. Jovanovich, though? You mean now? Tomorrow or, or the next day. No big deal. I'll ask him anything. Only, 
I'm not quite sure I'm getting an accurate reading on exactly what you want. Are you sure you're all right, Bill? I'll be in New York tomorrow. I'll call you then about the specifics, okay? Could you make it a little earlier in the business day, Bill? I laughed, and we hung up, and I called Zig in California. Everett Ziegler has been my movie agent for maybe eight years. He did the Butch Cassidy deal for me, and I woke him up too. Hey, Zig, could you get me a postponement on the Stepford Wives? There's this other thing that's come up. You're contracted to start now. How long a postponement? I can't say for sure. I've never done an abridgment before. Just tell me what you think they do. I think if it's a long postponement, they threaten to sue, and you'd end up losing the job. It came out pretty much as he said. They threatened to sue, and I almost lost the job, and some money, and didn't make any friends in the industry, as those of us in showbiz call movies. But the abridgment got done, and you hold it in your hands. The good parts version. Why did I go through all that? Helen impressed me greatly to think about an answer. She thought it was important. Not that she knew necessarily, but that I know. Because you acted crackers, Willie boy. You had me truly scared. So why? I never was worth beans at self-scrutiny. Everything I write is impulse. This feels right, that sounds wrong, like that. I can't analyze. Well, not my own actions, anyway. I know I don't expect this to change anybody else's life the way it altered mine. But take the title words. True love and high adventure. I believed in that once. I thought my life was going to follow that path. Prayed that it would. Obviously, it didn't. But I don't think there's high adventure left anymore. Nobody takes out a sword nowadays and cries, Hello, my name is Nika Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. In true love, you can forget about too. I don't know if I love anything truly anymore beyond the porterhouse at Peter Luger's and the cheese enchilada at El Parador's. Sorry about that, Helen. Anyway, here's the good parts version. S. Morgenstern wrote it. My father read it to me. And now, I give it to you. What you do with it will be more than passing interest to us all. Chapter 1. The Bride. So now we finally get to Chapter 1. The Bride. Now what's going to happen is that as we read it, there's going to be parts where he cuts out and then he comes in and explains why he's cutting out sections. In the past, when I skipped the introduction, kids got to those parts and they kept getting confused. So I spent more time going back trying to explain who this William Goldman guy was and why he's cutting out parts, and it just saved time and made it less confusing just to read that. It takes like two days to get through it, but it makes life easier in the long run. Now, with The Princess Bride, mm -hmm. there's, it's, there's essentially a fairy tale with this whole Princess Bride thing you're going to have. He says it's a satiric retelling of this history, but the way he does it is he sets it up like a fairy tale. You have a prince, a princess, he's the Princess Bride, Good guys, bad guys, fun stuff like that. So, Beauty and the Beast, The Princess and the Frog, those Disney movies, those are versions of a retelling of a fairy tale. All they do is they go through and tell you what that fairy tale is. This is not a retelling of a fairy tale. This one is what's going to be called a fairy tale satire. So it's where you take a normal fairy tale and you make fun of it while telling that fairy tale. You're familiar with versions of this. Shrek would be a satiric fairy tale where they take the idea of a fairy tale and they make fun of it the whole way through. So the idea of the Shrek movies was this idea of you have this ogre, and the ogre who looks like the bad guy becomes the good guy, the prince is the good guy becomes the bad guy. It's that same idea throughout this one. They're making fun of it that whole way through. If you saw Hoodwinked, it was the same idea, where they took this idea of this classic fairy tale and they made fun of it. So as we go through this one, it's supposed to be humorous. I apologize if the humor goes over your head. It'll be a little bit confusing because it's high-level humor because it was written a long time ago. Um, and people a long time ago had issues, so we just have to roll with it as we get into it. But that's going to be is this fairy tale. And it's set these two countries that aren't around anymore. They sort of dissolved since then. But it's these two countries called Gilder and Florin who were up in this little area at one time. Excuse me. And so it's going to deal with this war, this sort of civil war that breaks out between them, and that's where the princess comes in and things like that. Once again, those of you who have seen the movie, hopefully those two names, the floor and the gilder, sound familiar, you know the two more, but we'll figure it out as we go. <coughs> All right. This begins with the idea that any time you have a princess in a fairy tale, do 
Remember when it's calm and you have the same characters showing up in the same story over and over again? We talked about them in Fables way back when. It's the same thing that Hillbillies asked for for Christmas. Motif. Nicely done. The idea of a motif. If you have a princess and she's going to be in a fairy tale, what do we know about that princess? She's very pretty. Nicely done. So this one jumps right into making fun of that idea. So this one's, you guys ever seen People Magazine? Or People yeah. Magazine? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they have like the most beautiful people idea. Yeah. John Gore made the last one. <laughs> uh, and so you have this whole list as you go through. So this one starts off with the idea that there is this list of famous princesses. And it's going to go through this list. It's a make-believe list. He's making fun of the idea of beautiful princesses. So I have kids, he's like, was there really a list? of no, there was not really a list. He's making fun of the idea that princesses are beautiful. So just roll with it. The year that Buttercup was born, the most beautiful woman in the world was a French scullery maid named Annette. Annette worked in Paris for the Duke and Duchess de Guiche. Annette did not escape the Duke's notice that someone extraordinary was polishing the pewter. The Duke's notice did not escape the notice of the Duchess either, who was not very beautiful and not very rich, but plenty smart. The Duchess set about studying Annette and shortly found her adversary's tragic flaw, <coughs> chocolate. Armed now, the Duchess set to work. The Palace de Guiche turned into a candy castle. Everywhere you looked, bonbons. There were piles of chocolate-covered mints in the drawing rooms, baskets of chocolate-covered nougats in the parlors. Annette never had a chance. Inside a season, she went from delicate to whopping, and the Duke never glanced in her direction without sad bewilderment clouding his eyes. Annette, it might be noted, seemed only cheerier throughout her enlargement. She eventually married the pastry chef, and they both ate a lot until old age claimed them. Things that might also be noted did not fare so cheerily for the Duchess. The Duke, for reasons passing understanding, next became smitten with his very own mother-in-law, which caused the Duchess ulcers, only they didn't have ulcers yet. More precisely, ulcers existed, people had them, but they weren't called ulcers. The medical profession at that time called them stomach pains and felt the best cure was coffee dolled with brandy twice a day until the pain subsided. The Duchess took her mixture faithfully, watching through the years as her husband and her mother blew kisses at each other behind her back. Not surprisingly, the Duchess's grumpiness became legendary, as Voltaire has so aptly chronicled, except this was before Voltaire. So it starts off saying that the first when Buttercup, our princess of the story, was born, Annette was the most famous or the most beautiful girl in the world. Problem was, the guy that she worked for kept giving her winky, winky eye. Winky, winky. And so his wife decided to get rid of her. And how did his wife get rid of her? Put uh, chocolate. Put chocolates everywhere. everywhere. So she went from being like all petite and stuff, yay, to <laughs> and nice and big, which just made her happier. So she eventually marries the chef. The problem is her husband had issues. So who does her husband eventually do winky, winky eye with? Her yeah, her mom. And so it's just one of those things. People have issues. Great mythology for the women. Um, and so there you go, same idea. The year Buttercup turned 10, the most beautiful woman lived in Bengal, the daughter of a successful tea merchant. This girl's name was Aluthra, and her skin was of a dusky perfection, unseen in India for 80 years. There have only been 11 perfect complexions in all of India since accurate accounting began. Aluthra was 19, the year the pox plague hit Bengal. The girl survived, even if her skin did not. Pox is like chicken pox when your skin breaks out in like big old marky things. Apparently that's not what hot chicks have. When Buttercup was 15, Adela Terrell of Sussex on the Thames was easily the most beautiful creature. Adela was 20, and so far did she outdistance the world that it seemed certain she'd be the most beautiful for many, many years. But then one day, one of her suitors, she had 104 of them. Do you guys know what a suitor is? Yeah. Yeah? Like a date. On the right track, yeah. Someone who thinks you're hot and creeps on you. Creates, you know, Instagram pages about you and posts a whole bunch of pictures. God, I wish she was here. Um, and so that would be an idea of a suitor. They just think you're hot and they try to seek you out. Uh, too many fun things I could do. People watching at home have no idea what we're talking about, but it's okay if they were here. Exclaimed that without question, Adela must be the most ideal item yet spawned. Adela, flattered, began to ponder on the truth of the statement. That night, alone in her room, she examined herself pore by pore in her mirror. This was after mirrors. It took her until close to dawn to finish her inspection. But by that time, it was clear to her that the young man had been quite correct in his assessment. She was, through no real faults of her own, perfect. 
As she strolled through the family rose gardens watching the sunrise, she felt happier than she'd ever been. Not only am I perfect, she said to herself, I'm probably the first perfect person in the whole long history of the universe. Not a part of me could stand in proving how lucky I am to be perfect and rich and sought after and sensitive and young and... Young? The mist was rising around her as Adela began to think. Well, of course, I'll always be sensitive, she thought, and I'll always be rich. Uh, but I don't quite see how I'm going to manage to always be young. And when I'm not young, how am I going to stay perfect? And if I'm not perfect, what else is there? What indeed? Adela furrowed her brow in desperate thought. It was the first time in her life her brow had ever had to furrow, and Adela gasped when she realized what she had done, horrified that she'd somehow damaged it, perhaps permanently. Do you guys know what furrowing your brow means? Mm. It's when the brow comes together, like, because mm, she's thinking, and she's never had to think before. She's like, mm, and she thought she broke her eyebrows, because she's never had to do that before. Poor girl. <laughs> she rushed back to her mirror and spent the morning, and although she managed to convince herself that she was still quite as perfect as ever, there was no question that she was not quite as happy as she had been. She had begun to fret. The first worry lines appeared within a fortnight, the first wrinkles within a month, and before the year was out, creases abounded. She married soon thereafter, the self-same man who accused her of sublimity and gave him merry hell for many years. Buttercup, of course, at fifteen, knew none of this, and if she had, would have found it totally unfathomable. How could someone care if she were the most beautiful woman in the world or not? What difference could it have made if you were only the third most beautiful, or the sixth? Buttercup at this time was nowhere near that high, being barely in the top twenty, and that primarily on potential, certainly not on any particular care she took of herself. She hated to wash her face. She loathed the area behind her ears. She was sick of combing her hair, and did so as little as possible. What she liked to do, preferred above all else, really, was to ride her horse and taunt the farm boy. The horse's name was Horse. Buttercup was never very long on imagination. And it came when she called it, went where she steered it, and did what she told it. The farm boy did what she told him, too. Actually, he was more a young man now, but he'd been a farm boy when, orphan, he had come to work for her father, and Buttercup referred to him that way still. Farm boy, fetch me this. Get me that farm boy. Quickly, lazy thing, trot now, or I'll tell father. As you wish. That was all he ever answered. As you wish. Fetch that farm boy. As you wish. Dry this farm boy. As you wish. He lived in a hovel out near the animals, and... According to Buttercup's mother, he kept it clean. He even read when he had candles. Now, I'll leave the lad an acre in my will, Buttercup's father was fond of saying. They had acres then. You'll spoil him, Buttercup's mother always answered. He slaved for many years. Hard work should be rewarded. Then, rather than continue the argument, they had arguments then too. They would both turn on their daughter. You didn't bathe, her father said. I did, I did, from Buttercup. Not with water, her father continued. You reek like a stallion. I've been riding all day, Buttercup explained. You must bathe, Buttercup, her mother joined in. The boys don't like their girls to smell of stables. Oh, the boys, Buttercup fairly exploded. I do not care about the boys. Horse loves me, and that is quite sufficient. Thank you. She said that speech loud, and she said it often. Well, like it or not, things were beginning to Shortly before her 16th birthday, Buttercup realized that it had now been more than a month since any girl in the village had spoken to her. She had never much been close to girls, so the change was nothing sharp. But at least before, there were head nods exchanged when she rode through the village or along the cart tracks. But now, for no reason, there was nothing. A quick glance away as she approached, that was all. Buttercup cornered Camellia one morning at the blacksmith's and asked her about the silence. I should think, after what you've done, you'd have the courtesy not to pretend. You'd have the courtesy not to pretend to ask, came from Cornelia. What have I done? What? What? You've stolen them! With that, Cornelia fled. But Buttercup understood. She knew who them was. The boys. The village boys. The beef-witted, feather-brained, rattle-scold, clod-pated, dim-domed, 
noodle noggin, sap headed, lunk knob boys. How could anyone accuse her of stealing them? Why would anybody want them anyway? What good were they? All they did was pester and vex and annoy. Can I brush your horse, Buttercup? Thank you, but the farm boy does that. Can I go riding with you, Buttercup? Thank you, but I really do enjoy myself alone. You think you're too good for anybody, don't you, Buttercup? No, no, I don't. I just ride riding by myself, that's all. But throughout her sixteenth year, even this kind of talk gave way to stammering and flushing, and at the very best, questions about the weather. Do you think it's going to rain, Buttercup? I don't think so. The sky's blue. Well, it might rain. Yeah, I suppose it might. You think you're too good for anybody, don't you, Buttercup? No, I just don't think it's going to rain, that's all. <laughs> At night, more often than not, they would congregate in the dark beyond her window and laugh about her. She ignored them. Usually the laughter would give way to insult. She paid them no mind. If they grew too damaging, the farm boy handled things, emerging silently from his hobble, thrashing a few of them, sending them flying. She never failed to thank him when he did this. As you wish, was all he ever answered. When she was almost seventeen, a man in a carriage came to town and watched as she rode for provisions. He was still there on her return, peering out. She paid him no mind, and indeed, by himself, he was not important. But he marked a turning point. Other men had gone out of their way to catch sight of her. Other men had even ridden twenty miles for the privilege, as this man had. The importance here is it was the first rich man who had bothered to do so, the first noble. And it was this man, whose name is lost to antiquity, who mentioned Buttercup to the Count. So to fully grasp the full hotness of our young Buttercup, the princess, who, by the way, does she care about how attractive she is? No. No. And what do the boys keep trying to do to her? Yeah, they're trying to do the flirty, flirty thing, and she's kind of dense, and they're doing the flirty, flirty. She's like, what are you talking about? And now, of course, the problem is, people stop, if you've seen the movie, people stop to watch the girls go by. Buttercup, being one of the top 20 hottest girls in the world, people go out of their way, 20 miles just to drive and park their cars, and just watch her go by. Yes, it's creepy. <laughs> but don't worry, it gets worse. <laughs> The land of Florin was set between where Sweden and Germany would eventually settle. That was the picture of Sweden, Germany, up there. In theory, it was ruled by King Lotharin and his second wife, the Queen. But in fact, the King was barely hanging on, could only rarely tell day from night, and basically spent his time in muttering. He was very old. Every organ in his body had long since betrayed him, and most of his important decisions regarding Florin had a certain arbitrary quality that bothered many of the leading citizens. Prince Humperdinck actually ran things. If there had been a Europe, he would have been the most powerful man in it. Even as it was, nobody within a thousand miles wanted to mess with him. The Count was Prince Humperdinck's only confidant. His last name was Rugen, but no one needed to use it. He was the only Count in the country, the title having been bestowed by the Prince as a birthday present some years before. The happening taking place, naturally, at one of the Countess's parties. The Countess was considerably younger than her husband. All of her clothes came from Paris. This was after Paris. And she had superb taste. This was after taste, too, but only just. And since it was such a new thing, and since the Countess was the only lady in all Florida to possess it, is it any wonder she was the leading hostess of the land? Eventually, her passion for fabric and face paint caused her to settle permanently in Paris, where she ran the only salon of international consequence. For now, she busied herself with simply sleeping on silk, eating on gold, and being the single most feared and admired woman in Florinese history. If she had figure faults, her clothes concealed them. If her face was less than divine, it was hard to tell when she got done applying substances this was before glamour, but it hadn't been for ladies for the Countess. There would never have been a need for its invention. In sum, the Rugens were a couple of a week in Florin, and it had been for many years. Okay, this is me. All abridging remarks and other comments will be in this fancy italic type, so you'll know. When I said at the start that I'd never read this book, that's true. My father read it to me, and I just quick-skimmed along crossing out whole sections when I did the abridging, leaving everything just as it was in the original Morgenstern. This chapter's totally intact. My intrusion here is because of the way Morgenstern uses parentheses. The copy editor at Harcourt kept filling the margins of the galley proofs with questions. 
How can it be before Europe, but after Paris? And how is it possible this happens before glamour, when glamour is an ancient concept? See, glamour and the Aix and the Oxford English Dictionary, and eventually, I'm going crazy. What do I make of these parentheses? When does this book take place? I don't understand anything. Oh! Denise, the copy editor, has done all my books since Boys and Girls Together, and she'd never been as emotional in the margins of me before. I couldn't help her. Either Morgan Stern meant them seriously, or he didn't. Or maybe he meant some of them seriously, and some others he didn't. But he never said which were the seriously ones. Or maybe it was just the author's way of telling the reader stylistically that this isn't real. It never happened. That's what I think. In spite of the fact that if you read back into Florinese history, it did happen. The facts, anyway. No one can say about the actual motivations. All I can suggest to you is, if the parentheses bug you, don't read them. <coughs> As your teacher, read them. Um, that's where a lot of the funny stuff and, and the humor will happen is in the parentheses, and you'll get much more confused if you leave them out. Because whatever he's doing, he took real history and then just sort of used his imagination with it, where it's like a creative historical background thing. So it's the idea that you have this things that actually happen, and he just sort of plug stuff in as he goes through. Quick, quick, come! Buttercup's father stood in his farmhouse, staring out the window. Why? This, from the mother. She gave away nothing when it came to obedience. The father made a quick finger point. Look! You look! You know how! Buttercup's parents did not have exactly what you might call a happy marriage. All they ever dreamed of was leaving each other. Buttercup's father shrugged and went back to the window. Ah, he said after a while. And a little later again, ah. Buttercup's mother glanced up briefly from her cooking. Such riches, Buttercup's father said. Glorious. Buttercup's mother hesitated, then put her stew spoon down. This was after stew, but pfft, so was everything. When the first man first clambered from the slime and made his first home on land, what he had for supper that first night was stew. The heart swells at the magnificence, Buttercup's father muttered very loudly. What exactly is it, dumpling? Buttercup's mother wanted to know. You look, you know how, was all he replied. Zing, that'd be a roast. This was their 33rd spat of the day. This was, this was long after spats. You guys know what a spat is? It's a fight. So they're saying the fact that mom and dad, Buttercup's parents, fight all the time and they keep score. So as we continue, it's like they keep score between who's winning the fight going back and forth. Basically, it's like a roast off. Uh, and you see like, who gets more roast points from one to the other, so they keep going back and forth roasting each other. They have issues, too. Uh, this was their 33rd spat of the day. This was long after spats, and he was behind, 13 to 20. But he'd made up a lot of distance since lunch, when it was 17 to 2 against them. Donkey, the mother said. I'm guessing that's a curse word back then. <laughs> All the times I have no idea why she says donkey. Donkey, the mother said, and came over to the window. A moment later, she was going, ah, right along with them. <laughs> they stood there, the two of them, tiny and awed. From setting the dinner table, Buttercup watched them. They must be going to meet Prince Humperdinck someplace, Buttercup's mother said. The father nodded. Hunting, and that's what the prince does. How lucky we are to have seen them pass by, Buttercup's mother said. And she took her husband's hand. The old man nodded. Now I can die. She glanced at him. Don't. Her voice was surprising. <laughs> Sorry. Her voice... Just not, now I can die. No, don't do it right now. Just wait. Her tone was surprisingly tender, and probably she sensed how important he really was to her, because when he did die two years further on, she went right after him. And most of the people who knew her well agreed it was the sudden lack of opposition that undid her. Buttercup came... Sorry. Buttercup came close and stood behind them, staring over them. Soon she was gasping, too, because... The Count and Countess and all their pages and soldiers and servants and courtiers and champions and carriages were passing by the cart track at the front of the farm. The three stood in silence as the procession moved forward. Buttercup's father was a tiny mutt of a man who had always dreamed of living like the Count. He had once been two miles from the Count and Prince and been hunting, and until this moment, that had been the high point in his life. He was a terrible farmer, and not much of a husband either. There wasn't really much in the world he excelled at, and he could never quite figure out how he happened to sire his daughter. But he knew, deep down, that must have been some kind of wonderful mistake, the nature of which he had no intention of investigating. 
Buttercup's mother was a gnarled shrimp of a woman, thorny and worrying, who had always dreamed of somehow just once being popular, like the Countess was said to be. She was a terrible cook, and an even more limited housekeeper. How Buttercup slid from her womb was, of course, beyond her, but she'd been there when it happened, and that was enough for her. Buttercup herself, standing half a head over her parents, still holding the dinner dishes, still smelling of horse, only wished that the great procession wasn't quite so far away, so she could see if the Countess's clothes really were all that lovely. As if in answer to her request, the procession turned and began entering the farm. Here? Buttercup's father managed. Oh my God, why? Buttercup's mother whirled on him. Did you forget to pay your taxes? This was after taxes, but everything's after taxes. Taxes were here even before we had stew. Even if I did, they wouldn't need all of that to collect them. And he gestured towards the front of his farm, where now the count and countess and all their pages and soldiers and servants and courtiers and champions and carriages were coming closer and closer. What could they want to ask me about? He said. Go see, go see, Buttercup's mother told him. You go, please. No, you, please. We'll both go. They both went, trembling. Cows, the count said when they reached his golden carriage. I would like to talk about your cows, he spoke from inside, his dark face darkened by shadow. My cows, Buttercup's father said. Yes, you see, I'm thinking of starting a little dairy of my own. And since your cows are known throughout the land as being Florin's finest, I thought I might pry your secrets from you. And there we'll stop. There are about five super awesome mind-blowing scenes in the book. And the first one is coming up tomorrow. And it's not in the movie, which makes it so much better. No, the zoo of death is coming. That's much later. This is another scene that's coming up that is not in the book. That's going to be fun. Uh, once again, Mr. Butler will come around and collect. Tomorrow, you'll get to take the books home because you're going to have to read chapters 2, 3, and 4. But chapters 2, 3, and 4 are short. And so you'll get to take them home from there. We'll have a quiz on Friday over the introduction because we did it so might as well. Chapter 1, we'll finish. We'll get into chapter 2. I think uh, chapter 3 or 4 is only one page when you get to it. And then chapter 4, which is a little bit more. Which one? It looks just like the author. Yeah, is that chapter four? Yeah, it's just one page. Leave the book on the desk. I'll come around and pick it up. Or, Mr. Baldwin. Another night? Oh, wait. Bye, people.